I figure we'll break this down into two different things, like the investigation and then the reaction to it. Okay. All right. And we'll start with the investigation right. to help give people some context as to how we got here. But sort of overall, as the caretaker of the game, what has the last month been like? It's been um, a pressure-filled month uh, for us, for the entire Major League Baseball organization. Uh, we take the responsibility for protecting the integrity of the game very seriously. Um, you know, we work very hard to get the facts out in the investigation. And, you know, once you've done that and made a decision on discipline, it's kind of all you can do is sit back and watch the reaction. Right. We'll get to the reaction. But at what point were you aware of alleged cheating? When did that happen? Well, there, there were uh, um, questions raised late in the 2018 season. I remember particularly going into the playoffs. And we actually took steps to, we put monitors places, paid a lot more attention to cameras during the 2018 postseason in an effort to deal with it. But you have to understand, usually um, when we get a report, there are no facts surrounding it. It is somebody calls up, we think they have our signs. And that's a very difficult thing to deal with in terms of trying to figure out what's going on. And, and of course, that difficulty is compounded by, you know, something we've seen in this investigation, and that is kind of the cone of silence that mm -hmm. surrounds the dugout in the clubhouse. So late 18, because I mean, pe people have said there have been reports out there, um, formal complaints, whether it be the A's or others, that, that you were at least aware that there was cheating going on. Some people have suggested it's the worst kept secret in baseball. So before fire speaks, mm -hmm. why did it take so long for this to go where it went? Well, I think it goes back to what I just said. Uh, I mean, first of all, formal complaints, that would be an overstatement of what was happening. I mean, we were aware of rumors, um, not just about the Astros, but that there was sign stealing going on. Um, you know, remember in 17, we had investigated and disciplined the Yankees and the Red Sox, right? Mm -hmm. So um, th there were incidents. There was an incident in Arizona um, as well. Um, so as we got information every single time, there was an attempt to dig deeper to figure out what was going on. And as I said to you, I think you need to make it, put it in context. Some of them resulted in discipline. Yankees, Red Sox. Um, some of them resulted in us not being able to verify what people have had suggested, but they all took place against the backdrop of us trying to take measures to prevent it from happening. Video monitors, um, things like that. Right. What challenges did you face in the investigation? Well, the, the, the single biggest challenge in the investigation, and you know, it, it applies to us, but it also even applies to law enforcement where they have much greater powers than we have. You need someone to cooperate with you, um, someone to give you factual information. And um, the challenge here is everybody who knew the real facts about what were going on were kind of within that cone of silence in the dugout and the clubhouse. So I guess I would ask what, what level of awareness did you believe you knew this was going on, and then the frustration in your inability to get whoever it was to comment on it, to help, <coughs> you, help you with your case. Well, um, it, you know, the day-to-day -day frustration piece of it, I don't wear that much. I, I have a great um, investigations department. Um, they made every effort to try to get the facts out. And, you know, it's important to emphasize that was our fundamental goal. We, we felt that once um, there had been the reporting with the amount of detail there was on this topic that we owed it to the fans and the other teams to gather the facts and lay them out in a very transparent way. Um, so they went along in the investigation pursuing that goal and we did come to a point in time where we had to make a decision mm -hmm. about how we were going to crack the code of silence. So tell me about that decision. Well, um, you have to pick a group, right? Um, you have to decide, are you going to try to get 
maybe the field managers and the coaching staff. You're going to try to get the players. Who, who are you going to get to tell you uh, what was really going on? We landed on the players really for two reasons. Um, first of all, I believe uh, what I wrote in the Yankee Red Sox decision, that fundamentally um, the obligation to make sure players are playing within the rules falls on the general manager and the field manager. Uh, that is their responsibility. Players get paid, paid to compete. We all know competition, people get hot, sometimes they can make bad decisions. The management people are the ones who are responsible in the first instance to make sure what goes on on the field goes on within the, the, the rules that have been established. Um, secondly, we had a problem with the players in this case. Among the things that the Astros um, failed at was after the Yankee Red Sox decision. I put the clubs on notice as to what exactly the rules were and how they were going to be treated going forward. Among the other failures of that organization, that information never made its way to the players. How is that so, possible? Well, so they just didn't do it. I mean, it's in my report. They, the the, the um, memorandum went to the general manager, and then nothing was done it's from the GM down. Um, so we knew if we had disciplined the players, in all likelihood, we were going to have grievances and grievances that we were going to lose on the basis that we never properly informed them of the rules. So given those two things, number one, I knew where or I, I, I'm, I'm certain where the responsibility should lay in the first instance. And um, given the fact that we didn't think we could make discipline stick with the players, we made the decision we made. Having said that, I understand the reaction. Yeah. I, I mean, the players, um, some of them in a more articulate way than others, have said, admitted they did the wrong thing. And I understand that people want to see them punished for that. And in a perfect world, they would have been punished. When you found out that this memorandum never got to the players, what was your reaction to that? Um, it, it was part of um, the overall um, development of the conclusion uh, that there was a lot of responsibility at the GM and manager level here, that, that, that so many things um, that should have been done were not done. It, it does, in a sense, though, absolve the players of any responsibility, and players should know the difference between right and wrong. They don't need somebody over their shoulder telling them that. So how do you characterize the player's role in all this? Look, I think that... Um, this was a situation where the supervision, the management uh, by the GM and the manager were inadequate um, and it allowed what was probably a small mistake at the beginning to grow into something that was much, much bigger. Um, and um, I, I don't absolve the players of responsibility. I think that in their comments, at least some of them, um, you can see the fact that, that, that they understand uh, they have a fundamental obligation to play within the rules. Um, and I, I don't think any of them feel like they've been absolved, frankly. So in January, you sent a letter to Jeff Lunau saying most or all of the Astros players were active participants in the banging scheme on the barrel. Mm -hmm. At that point, this is January, right. at that point, what types of penalties or punishments are you considering? This is before you've gotten to the players or said we're going to grant immunity. What, what types are you considering then? Well, I, I think the, um, it's important to understand what that January letter that you refer to is. Um, we always in the investigation conduct the factual investigation the best we can, and then we get, kind of get to the key people that we're starting to think well, there may be discipline involved here. So what we do is we write um, kind of the most negative interpretation of the facts from that individual's perspective, give it to them in writing, and give them a chance to come in um, and refute what we think we have found. Right. So um, I, I think one of the problems with that letter is people have uh, mischaracterized it sort of as they had decided by this date that X was the fact. We were kind of putting out an indictment 
um, if you'll let me use the analogy, and giving Lunau Hinch an opportunity to respond to what we think we had found. Um, at that point in time, I had not really formulated um, sort of potential disciplines for anyone. I thought it was important to go into the interviews with AJ and Jeff with an open mind. Um, those interviews took place obviously after this letter. Right. And it was only after those interviews that I started to dis think through who, what, in terms of discipline. But I mean, you're pretty comfortable when you send the letter, as negative as you want to go, you're pretty comfortable with your great investigative unit that they're pretty accurate here. Right. I thought that um, they had done a phenomenal job gathering the facts, and I knew there was going to be discipline. Um, what I had not decided was exactly who, how far, and how hard. Right. All right, we'll get to that. So y your findings released on the 13th. You, you, you of course, abs you, you absolve Crane, the owner, Jim Crane, and then you kind of implicate through just naming them Lunau, Hinch, Cora, Beltran. Why only those four guys for the most part? Well, Lunau and um, Hinch were easy for me. Um, actually, Lunau, Hinch, and Cora were easy for me. Um, it, you know, when you look at the facts that were found by the investigative unit, um, Lunau was the baseball official, the highest ranking one. Um, we reached the conclusion he either knew or should have known what was going on and that he did inadequate things to prevent this type of behavior even after he was warned about it. So that was easy for me. Um, AJ, I mean, look, AJ's been very open about what went on. He knew it was happening. He didn't stop it. He was there every day. I mean, that's kind of the end of the story from my perspective. And, um, you know, I don't want to say uh, too much about Alex because we have an open investigation there. I, I will say um, the investigators confirmed what was in the original article that started all this, that Alex was at the core of what's going on. Um, the tough one f for us w was Carlos Beltran because of his status. Um, he was a player, right? He, it, it, right. And, and the activity took place while he was a player, and he was covered by the immunity. Um, the reason we ended up mentioning him was credibility. He had been mentioned so prominently in the original article. Uh, we thought that to not explain what we found about Beltran, people would see it as some sort of uh, lack of transparency, and we, we really wanted to avoid that above everything else. Uh, may, maybe for the people who are watching this, to understand the scope of the investigation is as concise as you can. I mean, what went into it? Who, who did get interviewed? How, how often? How frequently? Well, there were 70, I think there were 70 witnesses that were interviewed. Some of those witnesses were multiple times. In other words, we'd have an interview, we'd find something else from somebody else, and we'd want to go back and re-interview that individual. Um, there were literally tens of thousands of emails, texts, Slack messages. It's a messaging yeah, system. Um, that we, we uh, secured from the Astros. All of those had to be reviewed. Those generated follow-up. Um, but we're and, talking players. Oh, yeah, players. Owners, front, all yeah, the way up and down. All the way up and down the organization. Um, there was, uh, you know, I, really, the one thing that um, I am absolutely certain about in, in all of this, um, we cannot be criticized for leaving stones unturned. Um, every investigation, you know, can be imperfect in the sense that maybe you don't find out every last fact, you miss mm -hmm. something, what, whatever. Um, I, I, there was nothing available to us in terms of investigative routes that were not followed. So there are interns that apparently get involved, video room coordinators, it goes up the mm -hmm. chain of command, the relationships, whether it's the owner, the general manager, the manager, Everybody knows who these people are. I'm curious, what responsibility does the owner of the team have in all this? Well, I think the, the owner has the ultimate responsibility for what goes on as his franchise. I mean, that, you know, that goes back to the way we govern the game, right? I mean, that, that the owner has that obligation. Um, I, I think in this particular case, um, I was prepared based on what the facts showed to discipline an owner if, if I felt that that was appropriate. Um, I, 
I think when you discipline, um, you have to always rely on the evidence. When you get into disciplining people based on a concept, um, it, it's very difficult. What the evidence showed with respect to Jim was when he got the Apple uh, watch decision, the Yankees Red Sox decision and the subsequent follow-up from our office, that he did. Um, in kind of an unusual move for him, getting directly involved on the baseball side, he did um, instruct Jeff Lunau to make sure that uh, they were behaving in compliance with the rules. Um, when that happened, I, I felt that you know his effort in that regard um, was sort of the key to the finding we made with respect to the owner. Tell Lunau, we got to behave properly, and I'm now removing myself from the equation. Well, I, I think the last part's unfair. I mean, I think that um, he told them that he wanted Jeff to make sure that they were in compliance with the rules and this directive. Um, you know, he, he runs this business and another business. Um, when you give a direct subordinate, um, you know, uh, an order, um, I don't think it's unreasonable to rely on the fact that that's going to be carried right. out. So you, but you run baseball, so you dictate the culture there. The yeah. owner generally dictates the culture. How do you, how do you square with a culture that doesn't encourage an individual to come forward and say, "Hold on a second, this isn't right. We need to stop it." Because clearly, that wasn't encouraged, or people didn't feel comfortable enough to do that. Well, I, look, I think that the um, it, it's important to think about the deterrence um, aspect of this discipline. Um, it, you know, you had four. Um, pretty accomplished baseball people, um, mm -hmm. managers, GMs, that not only were suspended for a substantial period of time, but lost their jobs. Um, I hope that that's enough to make people at those levels understand the responsibility they have and make sure that they're playing by the rules. Um, the idea that Jim Crane was not disciplined here, I, I kind of disagree with that. I mean, he suffered. Um, he owns an organization. That organization was fined $5 million. Whether you think $5 million is a lot or not, it is the maximum amount allowed by the Major League Constitution. Gave up four draft picks, and people can minimize the effect of it. But if you talk to any good general manager, there's tens of millions of dollars of value involved in those first and second round picks. And then, of course, there's the last piece that's most important. Um, the public airing of what went on here is a form of discipline and maybe the most powerful deterrent of anything that we did here in yeah, terms but of But seemingly, discipline. for most people, you know, not enough. So I guess, what about the punishments? The current punishments would serve <coughs> as a deterrent to the players because they weren't punished. Yeah, I think the, um, the player piece of it um, is important to focus on. I think that you will see us, we're in the process of working through with the MLBPA what we're gonna do with players on this topic moving forward. Um, I explained to you in this particular case, you know, and, and you know, sort of in all of the cases in that 17, 18 period, there may have been a lack of clarity. We've solved that problem, but we do need a policy that's explicit in terms of making players feel responsibility for these types of behavior. In hindsight, was there any other way to go about this without blanket immunity that would allow you to punish certain players? Well, in, in, you could have made the choice to go with the management people um, and sort of given them immunity and found out how the players were involved. Whatever um, dissatisfaction is out there with the grant of immunity to players, I think it would have been 10 times worse if you let the management people off and then tried to go after the players. Hmm. Universally respected Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. I think whoever did that should be out of baseball the rest of their life. So describe your comfort level with a comment like that from a man who's so respected in the game. I, I understand. Um, if I've learned anything over the last five years, I've, understand, uh, I've come to understand that when you discipline, um, people are going to have views that may not be consistent with, with what you've done. I, I accept that. I accept that as part of the responsibility of the job. I accept the criticism as part of the responsibility of the job. 
Um, what I did here is I tried to get the facts. Uh, I laid them out in as transparent a way a a a as I could lay them out so people could, in fact, make their own judgments as to whether, you know, the discipline was strong, weak, whatever. Um, and, you know, I made decisions based on the evidence that I think were fair. Um, and, you know, people are going to have to decide whether I, I did a good job with that or a bad job. Yeah, and what was and what is your reaction to the reaction of the people, which seems to be, wow, we didn't get the players. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I understand um, people's desire to have the players pay a price for what went on here. Um, I think if you watch the players, um, watch their faces when they have to deal with this issue publicly, they have paid a price. To think that they're skipping down the road into spring training happy, um, I, that, that's just a mischaracterization of where we are. Having said that, I, the, the desire to have actual discipline imposed on them, I understand it, and in a perfect world it would have happened. Uh, we ended up where we ended up in pursuit of, uh, really, I think the most important goal, and that is getting the facts and getting them out there for people but to know. But in the future, it. it might be different. It, it could be different, yes. And what role does the Players Association play in all this? Look, you know, p p people forget about it, uh, but, you know, there is a federal law that requires us to deal with the MLBPA on things like wages, hours, terms, and conditions of employment, including discipline. Um, they have an obligation to represent their members. We're going to fulfill that obligation, but we're going to pursue a goal that puts the industry in a better position to deal with these issues on a go-forward basis. All right, as you watched the Astros spring training press conference, the one with Jim Crane, Dusty Baker, Altuve, and Bregman, I'm curious what was your reaction as you watched it in real time? I think that um, one of the most important things that has to happen in order to put this episode, um, is, people are never going to forget about it, but to move on from it um, is for the entire organization, starting from the top owner all the way through the players, um, to accept responsibility um, and to apologize not only to their fans, but to the fans across the other 29 teams. And um, I, 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 it's hard to deny the fact that um, that's going to be an ongoing process here. Um, it didn't get done the other day. Most people will describe it as an epic failure. How would you describe it? It was not successful. And then what follows to that? Are you involved with the follow-up to the way that it was handled, or are you clear of that? Yeah, we're, we're, look, um, whatever a team does, for better or for worse, I feel it's part of the responsibility uh, of my position. We'll continue um, to work with the Astros um, to help them put this behind them. Um, I think that um, in the time that's gone by, some players have been out individually. I think they did a much better job in terms of expressing um, res taking responsibility and expressing remorse, that process is going to continue. I've heard terms like arrogant, oblivious, um, not contrite. To, to what extent do you think the message you sent was the message that was received? Well, uh, that's a funny pronoun, the you there. You mean, I I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, you, you, you send the message that this is wrong, you cheated, and... The perception of many out there is that several of the Astros, especially at the higher levels, don't necessarily seem to be expressing that. I'd say this to you, Carl. I, I, I think um, that uh, their intentions um, may be different than the, the way that it came off, um, but I understand um, the reaction to the press conference, and I think that um, the organization, the Astros, the individual players, almost immediately um, realized the need to do more, and that's why you've seen players out there talking about this individually. What, what type of consideration have you given to stripping the World Series title? Well, in the context of my original decision, um, it was something that we talked about and analyzed extensively. It was a big topic of conversation between 
me and my senior staff. And how did you land on the decision you landed on? Well, I, I landed on it um, really several thoughts. Number one, um, it has never happened in baseball. Um, you know, and I, I am a believer um, in the idea that precedent matters um, and that when you deviate from it, you have to have a really good reason to do that, number one. Number two, um, I, I thought that the report um, gave people a really transparent account of what went on, um, that we put people in a position to make their own judgments about the behavior that went on. Um, that certainly has happened o over yeah. the last month. Um, and the idea of, you know, an asterisk or asking for a piece of metal back um, seems, you know, sort of a futile act. People are always know that there was something about the 2017 World Series uh, that was different, and they're going to know that because whether we made every decision right or wrong, um, we undertook a really thorough investigation and we had the intestinal fortitude to put out there the facts we found, even though they weren't very pretty. Yeah. How, how much do you struggle with that decision, not to strip that away? I don't, because Carl, I think once you start down that road, and this is the last piece of it, once you start down that road, where you stop um, is a really difficult thing to figure out. Do you go back? And you know every individual game, every series where someone, for example, broke the rules by using steroids, do I have to go back and clean all that up? It's just an impossible position to be in as an institution. Do you understand people who would suggest that? I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, look, um, a, a lot of people that suggest that, there's actually a positive in it. It's, it, it's people whose fandom is so strong. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, I, I'm a Dodger fan through and through and I feel like I didn't get a fair shake and they shouldn't have the benefit. I understand that. I do. Now, speaking of Dodgers, so Cody Bellinger, Jim Crane's punishment, weak. Manfred's punishment, weak. They were cheating for three years. Altuve stole an MVP from Judge. They stole the ring from us. How much truth is there in what he says? I don't agree um, that the disciplines were weak. Um, I, I, I really don't. I think that the disciplines um, are strong enough that they will deter people from engaging in this behavior going forward. Um, I, I think that you need to, to think about the overall context in terms of what's been done to people's reputations, what they're going to have to answer questions about, arguably for the rest of their lives. Um, I understand Cody's uh, passion uh, for, for the game, um, but I don't agree with those comments. I, I, we heard Jim Crane, whether he misspoke or not, I don't think that the uh, cheating had any impact on the result. What's your reaction to that comment? Look, I didn't play. Um, all I know is that throughout the investigation, I mean, this one and the Boston investigation, every single player that we talked about um, this with admitted that if you knew what was coming, it was an advantage. All right, so Mike Rizzo, technology's here, replay's here. There are ways to curtail it. I think Major League Baseball is going to take further steps. What are those steps? Yeah, well, there is no question um, that um, we will have a new policy before the 2020 season begins. Um, the core of that policy is going to be to restrict asset, uh, access to um, video during the game. Um, you know, I, I, I think about other sports. Um, you know, I don't deny that video can help you perform if you have access to it during the game. But, you know, a golfer can't come off on the sixth hole and take a quick look at what he's doing with his swing. We're going to have to learn to live with less access to live video in and around the dugout and clubhouse. I guess, you know, you bring up other sports. It's interesting that in the last week here, you know, you had the Soccer Federation mm -hmm. ban a team from Champions League for two years and mm -hmm. fine them $30 million. Does a statement like that at all resonate with you with regards to this or even future cases? Look, I think that um, when you have misconduct uh, by a club, by an organization, by a player, um, you have to consider every single form of discipline that's available to you out there. And um, my responsibility 
is to try to pick discipline that is consistent with the facts that you find. Um, and, you know, I understand that there are scenarios where, you know, you may take more drastic action. You've seen it in other sports. Um, you know, at the time, uh, particularly given the facts we had here, I picked what I thought was the best discipline. There, there are comparisons to other scandals within baseball over the course of this history. Where do you, as the commissioner, sort of put this scandal relative to steroids or uh, the 1919 Black Sox scandal? Where, where does this fit in? Well, you, you know, we actually talked a lot about um, trying to figure out an order there because it helps you think through what should happen in terms of discipline. I think that the worst scandal has to be a scandal that involved people not trying to win, right? Uh, that, that, that's the worst possible thing um, that can happen. I, I, I think this um, comes in behind that, right behind it, um, and I think it's so serious because um, it's tangible. It's not like breaking a financial rule that applies to how many players you can sign in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. This is about what happens on the field in a tangible way and I put it so high on the list in terms of how serious it is because our fans can touch it. They, 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 they feel it. And um, I, I understand that and I think it explains a lot of the, you know, reaction to... Um, yeah. And yet the, the players don't get punished and you can understand that. I do. I, I, look, I, Carl, I, I, you know, if I've not been clear about it, let me say it before. Uh, I, again, I, I understand um, that desire. It, and in a perfect world, um, they would have been disciplined. Um, we gave them immunity in pursuit of w what we thought was the most important goal, that is, you know, clearing the air. I mean, can you imagine if we'd done an investigation, we granted nobody immunity, we preserved our ability to discipline everybody, and we couldn't find enough facts to, to, to defend the discipline? I mean, it, it, we it, couldn't do that. It does raise the question that if you didn't have Mike Fires and you didn't grant immunity, would we be in the same position going into this year as we have been in, in 17 and 18? Look, Mike Fires, um, in my view, did the industry a service. Um, he, he opened the door here. Without that opening of the door, um, we would not have been able to ha conduct the effective investigation that we did. Uh, we would not have been able to impose the disciplines that were imposed. We would not have been able to probably take the prophylactic measures that we're going to take with respect to 2020. And it's important, um, painful, but important that we clean all that up. Conceivably, the answer is yes, then. We could have been in the same spot without somebody like that. Right. Um, this one is close to me and probably you, given your affinity for youth sports. You have little leaguers now in California, and I'm sure around the country, who will not use the name Astros <laughs> during this season and who knows how long. Um, what impact does that message send to you? I think, for me personally, one of the most troubling pieces of all this um, was the message that we sent to young people about the game. Um, you know, I, I do believe that um, our game is special in that it teaches values to young people that serve them well, whether they become baseball players or not. Um, and when you hold that belief uh, and you see what's, what happened here, you have to accept the fact that this was a step backwards for us, one that we're going to have to work really, really hard to correct. Right. All right, so how would you describe the investigation of the buzzer? How uh, deep did that go? Well, the, the, the buzzer allegation, the, the, fi the tape and everything, we were fully aware of that when we were working our way through the investigation. Um, I think that, um, in a way, um, the, the piece that no one appreciates is that we found no evidence, not a single witness um, who could corroborate that there were buzzers being used during the 2019 season, indeed, that they were doing anything inappropriate during the 2019 season. Um, given that the players told us you know, chapter and verse about 2017 and chapter and verse about 2018, 
um, it does give some credibility to the de denials that were uniform uh, uh, about the use of buzzers in 2019. Um, can I tell you 100% certain that um, it didn't happen? Uh, no, uh, you can never know that. You gotta, you know, people tell you mm -hmm. what they tell you. I, I, I will tell you the evidence on this issue um, was as consistent in the direction that nothing was going on as the evidence was consistent in the direction that there was inappropriate behavior in 17 and 18. The, the, the sort of non-denial denial or the Altuve, let's just look at the MLB investigation versus coming out and saying, I never used a buzzer. How did you react to that? Um, I, I, I thought that uh, that answer um, could have been better given what we were told during the investigation. Is there anything in hindsight now that we're here a month later you would have done different? Oh, you know, hindsight is a dangerous uh, undertaking. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that um, over time, um, people will come to understand the, the significance of the discipline that was imposed here. Um, and, you know, do I wish that um, I could have figured out a way to do this that would have um, sparked less controversy publicly? Yeah, I do. Uh, I don't know what that is sitting here right now. Um, it, it, uh, I was hopeful that the transparency in the decision would help us move on from that, and it's taken longer to do that than I expected. It, it has become, to some degree, a referendum on your leadership. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And the reaction has been, for the most part, negative. There have been some studies. I know ESPN did a study. 86% of the people agreed with the punishments, and yet three-quarters of them said the players should have been punished as well. When you sit in the commissioner's office and look out at to where the sport is, and it's your sport, how do you mm -hmm. feel about it today? Look, I think that um, leadership is a really important component about what goes on in the job. I think that um, I, I, it is my responsibility to show a steady hand, um, to show the clubs, our fans, that we're serious about this issue, um, that we have the capacity to develop rules and policies that will move the industry forward. And, um, you know, referendums, public polls, they, they are what they are. Um, y y y you know, um, I'm aware of them, uh, but it doesn't really motivate me to do my job differently. I I'm doing the very best I can with a very difficult set of circumstances, and I have every confidence that I can move this game forward. Good. Okay, off the subject of the Astros, R rules. Um, you know, kind of four categories, the batter minimum, et cetera, your, mm -hmm. your DL, your 20 seconds to challenge. Um, why only those rules? Were there other rules you've considered? Oh, we've considered a, a wide variety of rules. We've talked to the Players Association about them. I think that why only those rules? You know, we're midterm in a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. We have to bargain next year. Um, I, I, I think when you understand that bargaining obligation, it's difficult to make, um, to convince the union we should be making very significant changes in the game against that backdrop. Along the lines of rules, we've talked about players being outspoken. Trevor Bauer, uh, he described you this way on your playoff proposal. Too absurd for too many reasons to type on Twitter and... You have absolutely no clue about baseball. You're a joke. This is a Major League Baseball player talking about the commissioner. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think if you um, look back on the questions we've already gone through, I'm pretty good about accepting um, people's views and criticisms. Um, I don't have to agree with them. Um, and I'll say this uh, uh, about that particular comment, no matter how much, how completely I disagreed with what a player thought about something, there's no way I would speak about a major league player like that. To the extent of uh, cheating being prevalent in the game, meaning it's the worst kept secret in baseball, would you describe that as close to fact or is that far from fact? I, I, I think that's an overstatement. Um, I, I really do. I, I look, I, I think that, you know, even in terms of some people's reaction, um, 
I, I think detailed knowledge of the facts about what went on here is less widespread among people than you might think. And I think that some of the views that get expressed are exaggerated because they don't really understand what happened. Is there a better way for us to understand or them to understand? Oh, that's an individual <laughs> responsibility, Carl. I mean, I, I, I think that the, the key from our perspective is what I've mentioned multiple times, transparency. Find the facts, put them out there, and hope people take the time to understand. As you look into the Red Sox, where is that investigation currently? We're in the final stages of the Red Sox investigation. Um, not as fast as um, I had hoped when, when we began, uh, but I think speed is secondary here to making sure that you get it right, particularly given what's gone on with another club, how thorough we were. And we're doing exactly the same thing with the Red Sox that we did with the Astros, a complete, thorough, every lead investigation. To your point, I've spoken with people who are involved with the organization who have suggested that some of the things that they were told prior to the 2018 LCS changed behavior so that what you would find, and there are reports out there that you'll find that the Red Sox did far less than the Astros, that maybe the deterrent actually worked. Where do those reports come from, and can you comment on how accurate they may be? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on any aspect of the Red Sox investigation. To the extent that um, we did things that slowed people down, deterred them from misconduct, I'm, I'm glad about that. I really am. Pete Rose came out and compared the lack of punishment to players to his own situation and apparently sent a 20-page uh, application to be reinstated to baseball. Yeah, I'm not going to um, comment on the merits of that application because I'm going to have to rule on that one as well at some point. I, I, I will But say, you are considering it? I, well, I have to consider it. I think I have an obligation to consider it. Um, I will say this. Um, throughout this, uh, I have been resolute um, in one concept. Whatever somebody else was doing or not doing is not relevant to judging your conduct. You're, responsi you're responsible for your conduct, and if everybody else was doing it, I, I don't see that as a mitigating factor. I never will. Um, it's kind of part of my makeup, and I, I, y you, know, you have to take responsibility for your actions. You've made a huge commitment to growing the game, mm -hmm. and part of the minor league plan is to eliminate teams uh, in different cities. How does that serve to help grow the game? Well, let's start with the facts. Again, you know, understanding um, what actually happened is important. The plan that we put in front of minor league baseball preserved baseball, gave an opportunity to preserve baseball in every single city where we have it today. Um, the minor leagues, in an effort to generate public support, um, have mischaracterized that proposal publicly um, in a way that has not been helpful in terms of making a deal. Um, what this negotiation is about is making sure that when we send young men to play professional baseball somewhere, they play baseball in a facility that is acceptable in terms of our developmental goals. And we have a number of facilities that are out there where minor league owners simply have done the wrong thing in terms of investing in their facilities. And they put players in conditions that not only are detrimental to our developmental goals, but just plain are not safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. Two more quick ones. Um, as you heard Dusty Baker bring up the concept of Major League Baseball protecting against retaliation for the Astros cheating. What, if anything, can you do? Well, I can give you two answers to that. Um, we are, uh, have been working on, for some time, uh, a, a memorandum um, about being hit by pitches, intentionally throwing at batters. Um, it, it's really dangerous, really a dangerous undertaking, and completely independent of the Astros investigation, we will be issuing um, at the beginning of this week a memorandum about hit by pitches, which um, will increase the disciplinary ramifications of that type of behavior. Um, I think that will be a tool that will be helpful uh, to us in terms of dealing with whatever flows from, from the Houston situation. The second thing, um, over the next uh, three days, I'm going to meet with all of the managers in Major League Baseball 
and the topic that you raise will be one of the things that I intend to address with them. It is simply not appropriate to express whatever frustration you may have by uh, growing out of the Astro situation by putting someone physically at risk by throwing at them. It's right. just not acceptable. And usually this time of year, there's a lot of optimism and people are excited about baseball. And clearly that's not currently the case. In, in your opinion, when does that page get turned? I think that um, it's going to take a little time here. I, I, I really do believe that it's going to take time and it's going to be um, driven by individual decisions and comments that are made by players, organizations, and by Major League Baseball. Is there anything else you'd like to say about any of the subjects we talked about? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.